So John, I have a little bit of a road map. We can follow it. We'll try to follow it. If not, we'll just freestyle, you know? Okay. Um, I thought we would <laughs> take the first 15 minutes and we talk about your personal history with New York in, as it intersects with your love of history of New York. I'm going to have to put a time limit on Robert Moses' discussion, apparently. John, we'll talk about that for a long time. <laughs> Uh, then we'll talk about a movie or two from each decade that, of yours that touches to New York. And then I wanted to ask you a few questions that intersect with the anniversary exhibition. That was my plan. All okay? Right. All right. Born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens? Yes. Tell me, uh, tell me you're from Brooklyn without telling me you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm from Brooklyn now. I've lived in Brooklyn longer than I've lived anywhere else. I, uh, but my, my mother was uh, born in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, she was a proud Brooklynite. And uh, I was born there, but then I grew up in Hollis, and then Ro Rosedale, Queens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I grew up in the country of, of Queens. Which is, uh, <laughs> that's what Chris Walken says. My, my country, Queens. He goes, it, I mean, just you know, mentally, it's very far away from uh, Manhattan. <laughs> and emotionally. <laughs> you lived in a garden level apartment at one point. In house. We all, all, yeah. And you all shared a room? My mother, my father, my older brother Ralph and me, we all lived in the same bedroom and I slept in that uh, in the crib until I was uh, five years old. <laughs> I was way too big for the crib. And, and I, used to, I used to like jump, you know, <laughs> go into the, and you know, I was like, come on, Ma, you know, it's, you know, we gotta move, you know. Uh, yeah, it was a garden apartment and uh, it was a very, very, very diverse neighborhood. And uh, it was, a, you know, we just played in the street, basically. That's mm -hmm. what we did. So, yeah. What's something from the way you grew up and how your parents raised you that really served you well in your career? I think that I wasn't in a, uh, you know, in a homogeneous type of uh, neighborhood mm -hmm. where, you know, there was a lot of people uh, of all different colors and backgrounds. And I think that really helps for the first five, six years of your life. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to a neighborhood that was more predominantly uh, Caucasian, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was, was a big uh, adjustment for me, uh, yeah. because it was a different kind of dynamic than I had experienced before. So uh, it's just a different, it's just different when you know different kinds of people and you can select friends from those different kinds of people. Yeah. You know? And yeah. then you're like, oh, well, this is my friend, and this person's a nerd, and <laughs> this person's really boring. You know? and, uh, so you see it right away. And I think that really uh, definitely uh, influenced me. And then, and then I was, for junior high school, I was bussed out. I was bussed out of my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went to, uh, and, it was 90% black junior high school in Springfield Gardens, uh, uh, junior high school, 59. And that was a whole, that was right at the, you know, 1968. Wow. And it was the first day I went to school. They, everyone had uh, those buttons, because uh, James Brown was very popular. And, it, you know, he, he was popular before and after. But they had, I'm black and I'm proud button. And that was my first day of junior high school. Someone put it on me. I was, I, I, <laughs> I was quite tan at the time <laughs> uh, uh, and dark, and I was like, "All right, you know, sure, I go with that." You know what I mean? So, uh, 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 but uh, that was, a, you know, that was really that was interesting because I was yeah. really a minority there yeah. versus in Hollis. It was, it was, you know, we were it was maybe sixty forty, you know, black white like that. So, uh, but I, I think all those were big seminal experiences mm -hmm. for me. And, uh, and it was, you know, that's when I fell in love with basketball and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, I was like, wow, I, all these kids played from Andrew Jackson. I had never seen basketball played like that. And so uh, I, I think that definitely uh, has influenced me you sure. know, as a person. So, 
Is it true, because you know the internet, is it true uh -oh. um, that you've never been on, you weren't on a plane until you were 22 or 23? Yeah, that's right. I, I, the first time I went on a plane was to uh, St. Louis to see my wife, Kathy uh, Borowitz, in a, in a play. Yeah, I think she was had a gobbler there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was the first time I was on a plane. Yeah. That's yeah. love. And uh, and then now I've traveled, you know, sure. all over the world many times. And uh, but yeah, that was a big deal for me, you know. Yeah. Were yeah. you interested in life outside of your bubble? Yeah, absolutely. But um, how just, did you uh, how did you get interested? Was by you, you know, reader? movies, yeah. reading books, music. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my father was born in Italy, you know, and he came here in '25 after the gates. Basically, when they closed the gates uh, when they, uh, in 1924, mm -hmm. when, they, when they put a, uh, you know, a number on every uh, country, you know, uh, a quota. Uh, there's a great book, The Guardian Gate, that's about that. But my f grandfather was caught in the, the middle of it, but he had a residency here. But until he be could become a citizen, they couldn't come over until like he was six, or six and a half, seven years old. Uh, uh, because they had a quota after mm -hmm. that, so yeah. I was watching the Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates yeah. that, that you did. Yeah. W were you nervous about that at all? Uh, no, no. I was. I love history. Yeah. But I was. It was for almost everyone who's on the show. Uh, it, it's an emotional thing, yeah. and there's lots that they we couldn't have, and that they asked, "Do do you want to? You know, uh, even." Do you want to, us to share these upsetting things? And I said, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, I've stayed in contact, and we're quite you know, friendly through email. Mm -hmm. But it was a really uh, fantastic ex, uh, experience for me. And I learned some things, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, yes, you did. Yes, I did. Yeah, at I one, learned. At one point, you said, with my family, nothing surprises me. No, nothing <laughs> surprises me. It just, uh, no. And... Uh, you know, but it got me interested, and I've done more research. You know, uh, I mean, you know, we talked about it. You know, I lost my grandmother to, you know, it was a, a botched abortion, and my mother wound up going to, you know, an orphanage, and uh, so I, I've done a, like a lot of research. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in that subject matter because I kind of knew what had occurred, and I also saw what the result of that was. But I think it's just. It's a great show, and uh, I, I was, it was fantastic to be on it and learn all these different things <laughs> <laughs> that I had. A, you know, my grandfather had so many different wives, and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and he also, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, I, I, did, I never knew that he was married to a black woman. His third wife. It, yeah, yeah, Elder Deborah, and, and they called him Mr. Deborah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <laughs> And I just thought, I said, well, no one ever told me that, you know? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it was great. I mean, I, I love finding things out, even if it's, you know, surprising or painful or whatever. Yeah. Uh, who in your family was the person who was the most supportive of you pursuing my art, mother. the arts? Your my, mom my, my, my mother was a really talented person, you know? And uh, I think, you know, she... There were so many things she could do, and she never had an opportunity to do them. But you know, she could paint, she could draw, she could sing, she she could cook. She, you know, she should have been a had a, had a professional you know career. And she used to make uh, you know wedding dresses. I used to help her, oh. you know, and I used to sometimes model the dresses oh. because the dummy was too short. And, uh, <laughs> but my mother, uh, I always saw how she never really pushed me or anything. But uh, her and all her girlfriends, I used to always eavesdrop on their conversations. I was going to make a documentary about her and a lot of her girlfriends, and I, I lost the money at the last moment years ago. But I think I, I, it opened my mind up to saying, well, here's, mm -hmm. this is really where the power is in our families, and this is the glue that keeps us together. So yes. I mean, my father influenced me mm -hmm. too, but my mother more so, I think. When you think back on history, what's a moment in history, a, his, a really big moment in history that shaped the way you think about the world? Well, I would think, you know, watching 
the news, the assassination of JFK, mm -hmm. uh, all the civil rights that think uh, that was aired for the first time, mm -hmm. watching all this uh, those Holocaust uh, uh, documentaries because my father was in World War II, mm -hmm. he could have been on the other side, you know, because he was yeah. he came from Italy, and uh, so I used to watch that with my mother and father, all those things, and there were discussions about it. Too, and sometimes with different points of view, yeah. you know, within this, you know, between them, uh, and uh, I think just being able to be interested in other people or be compassionate to their dilemma mm -hmm. and, and plight, and that's something that you know that interests me because there are a lot of people who don't have voices. Who in New York history would you spend a day with? In my in history, in all of history. Wow. In New York history, specifically. In New York history? Yeah. Oh, that's hard. Ah, New York history, okay. <laughs> oh, my, well, I'm, I'm reading Robert Caro right now, so I would, you know, I, I'd put him up there. Uh, but there are so many people that I'd like mm. to, you know, I, I'd love to be in a room with a few writers that, like, like yeah. Primo Levi and W.E.B. Du Bois together. Mm -hmm. I would think of oh, that be a good conversation. So uh, 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 I don't know. There's, who, there's so many people I, you know, admire. Whether they're musicians or you know, writer, writers, writers, I would go towards. How about who in New York history would you like to give a piece of your mind to? What? Who in New York history would you like to give a piece of your mind to? Robert Moses, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was called an entry uh, at the same Moses, way yeah. in the business. Guys. A lot of other people too, you know. A lot, you know, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, that I'm just. I mean, I'm. Your wife says you gasp when yeah, you read. I'm reading the. the well, the, I'm reading the Power Broker uh, and finally. Then you gasp yeah, at and night. I, it's just an amazing. It's an amazing book of how someone can be an idealist and become such a dictator, mm -hmm. can be so brilliant and be, become so, and is so despicable as a human being and. Uh, like I'm, you're watching a brilliant monster in a way. But I think Robert uh, Caro, he really delineates the character of a person. And you, all these people become so alive. And he describes one thing of Moses when he's young in an argument and he does something with his hand. It's like, no, he does like, like a four-year-old. But the way he describes it, it, basically that's his whole character. He will never, he never wants to lose. Mm -hmm. And if he loses, then he has to get revenge on you and crush you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he just, it's really impressive. It's like reading a, something that Shakespeare invented, but it's real, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's beyond that, actually, so much. So. What was your first New York stage play? That you uh, my first New York stage play? Well, I did a lot of off off Broadway. That's okay. That's in New York. That's okay. I was in a play called. Uh, I was in a rock and roll play called. Uh, I did Waiting for Godot years later, but yeah, this was yeah. called Waiting for the Dough, and it, was, uh, uh, and it was really pornographic. It was at the West Bank. It was crazy. It was doing all these. And I played all these characters. And I was a substitute school teacher at the time. I, I taught half the year at Rice High School in Harlem, and then I taught at Our Lady Queen of Martyr in Inwood, fifth and sixth graders. And they came to see the play. It was in the New York Post, and uh, the New York Post. And I was, I, they had, I was grading tests. It was like quiet hour at the end of the day. And anyway, I saw the New York Post. I opened it up. Maybe this was in the morning. I don't know. And I. They mentioned me in it. I had no lines, but they said I had, you know, charisma or something like that. And I was like, oh my God. They, and I had 30 kids. And I said, you know, they knew. I, I told them I do acting mm -hmm. sometimes. And I said, look, I'm in the newspaper. Look, and, they, and all of them, almost in unison, that's not you, Mr. Turturro. <laughs> That's not you. You're 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 fantasizing, basically. I was like, no, it's really me, you know. And uh, yeah, so that was one of the early plays. I did a lot of plays at West Beth, and I did some plays that eventually one became a movie. Mac, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. What uh, what was the first play you directed? Uh, well, in college, I directed a couple things, and I think I did a double. Uh, at West Beth, uh, a Lorca play called The Love of Don Polimplin 
for Belisa in his garden on a double bill with Cavalleria Rusticana, the play by Giovanni Verga. And so they were both uh, you know, Spanish and an uh, Italian mm -hmm. uh, uh, writer. Uh, uh, so I, it was, you know, it was uh, two things that interested me. As I was going through all your different interviews about movies you made. Oh my God. You, dress, you just drop movie references. You're a cinephile. You love film. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of film, there's a lot of countries of film that I, I haven't been really properly exposed to yet, mm -hmm. too. But when I was a kid, you know, I used to watch a lot of old movies with my parents and watched a million dollar movie like a lot of people did, <laughs> which was on five nights a week. And, but some of those old actors are, I, they're just, they're like family members to me, yeah. even the way they walk, you know, like Barbara Stanwyck, for example, a great. Brooklynite. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I love Barbara Stanwyck. Uh, uh, but I, I like people who come from the theater, vaudeville, the circus, mm -hmm. like Burt Lancaster, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and who were involved, like, like Burt Lancaster. He was involved in mm -hmm. so many uh, civil rights issues. And, you know, he, he was, he's from Harlem, and, uh, and he was in one of the, the settlement, the Union Street Settlement House. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are people who, they inspire me what they, what they were able to do with their fame or notoriety, so. Let's start to talk about some movies. 1980, the 80s first. Uh, do the right thing. How did you and Spike Lee meet? Uh, Spike Lee saw me, I was in a John Patrick Shanley play, Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, and then John got me in this movie, Five Corners, with Jodie Foster, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a really great role. It wasn't that big of a, a hit, but a lot of people saw it, and I did a lot of crazy things in it. And uh, Spike, uh, I think, wanted some big, big name actors, and they said no to him, and then he saw me in this movie. <laughs> and, uh, I don't wanna see who. Uh, 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 but, uh, and we met at his office, and uh, I read the script, and I, as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, this is, this is about something. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you know, uh, uh, I would love for you to be in the film. And I said, okay. I said, well, what part do you want me to play? He said, well, what part do you want to play? And I said, I, I, I'd rather play, you know, the racist brother. Because I said, that's, it's a more interesting character. Mm -hmm. I said, and uh, uh, so then we, you know, we, we really hit it off. He was very, very shy. And we got to know each other and, uh, and we, you know, we're, we're a few weeks apart. We're born a few weeks apart. We and we just really, uh, I don't know, just bonded in a in a very deep, like almost mm -hmm. without talking about mm -hmm. it too much. And I would bring him a lot of stuff, and I shared a lot of things that he didn't know, and he was delighted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was delighted. And Ernest Dickerson who was a wonderful, wonderful guy. I've worked with as a director, Wynn Thomas, Ruth Carter. And so it was a great group. We had lots of rehearsals. And you just, you know, you knew it was exciting to yeah. make that movie. A lot of movies aren't exciting. But that movie was exciting to make. And there were also very, a lot of really beautiful people on the set too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but it was, yeah. And, and we just, you know, we've, we have a really close friendship, and it's uh, and it's remained that way. I had Ruth Carter in my show. I guess it was about two weeks ago, uh -huh. and she's won the Oscar for both Black Panthers. Right. And she did the costuming for for Do the Right Thing, and she yep. said Spike said, "You gotta call John. John's got ideas. You gotta call John." Ruth. Yeah. That's well, because she that's did. What it sounded like. She's yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she yeah. said you had very specific ideas oh, about yeah. what your character should wear. Oh yeah, because because she didn't know like certain shops. And I said, listen, my mother makes, you know, she, my mother wanted to be a dress, you know, make mm -hmm. her, have her own business. But I said, my mother knows. So she said, well, you go with your mother. My mother took me to a Kujin shop, you know, <laughs> and that culottes black outfit I have. My mother, so she said, that's what they wear. She mm -hmm. said, you just show that to Ruth. And I showed it to Ruth and Ruth was like dying. And she said, oh, wow. And I had these real great Italian t-shirts from Italy which were made differently, the, like the, the guinea t-shirts, they call them, you know. But they were made, you know, in Italy, it was yes. different. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> and she was really uh, so yeah. And so Ruth, we always worked together. Yeah. When we did Jungle Fever, we we decided because I had so much hair from Barton Fink that would make like this. Larry Cherry was the haircut. He made like a poodle haircut for me, <laughs> and we had these really soft outfits. So it's like my hair was soft and my sweaters were soft and my pants were mm -hmm. baggy. So we 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 collaborated, you know, uh, a, a bunch of times, a bunch of times. You've made more than nine movies with Spike? Nine? Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of cameos, but yeah. I've done like maybe four or five movies where I had, you know, real, you know, Clockers, I had a bigger role, but mm -hmm. a lot of it got cut, so, uh, because it was just too long. Uh, but I, I still liked making it, you know. Uh, but yeah, but sometimes he asked me to come and, you know, give a blessing. To the <laughs> I'd love to do something, you know, uh, meaty again yeah. with Spike, yeah, I would. What's something that he does as a director and does specifically for you to help you in your performance that you have an experience with other people? He gives you your, your head. You know, mm -hmm. he, he gives you uh, agency. You mm -hmm. know, he allows you to be, to contribute. And some directors talk the talk, mm -hmm. but they don't walk the talk and he does and he's delighted when you come up with things and we also did a lot of improvisation rehearsals and then we would incorporate it but he loves when you can come up with something that's uh, physical and you know like you know we had a scene to do the right thing where we were talking and I said this scene doesn't really work with you know with my brother and he said, well, you know, I said, you have brothers. What do you do? He goes, well, we fight. I said, yes. Mm -hmm. So then I, <laughs> so I grabbed Richard and I put him in a headlock. And, and, mm -hmm. and I said, but, I, you know, this is how you, a brother would say, you know, I really love you. Listen to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you're strangling the guy. And uh, uh, so Spike will allow you to try that. Now, maybe it doesn't work. But you, you, you feel like your unconscious starts to working. You're not monitoring yourself. So that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. I also like to make him uh, surprised. I want to delight, I, I, I want to delight him, you know, mm -hmm. so. A lot of people you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they just, they're just not receptive to yeah. it, you know. They're just like standing there like, well, that's not what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, well, that's, you know, that's too bad, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, you're never gonna get you know, that extra, mm. that extra, that unconscious part of yourself. And that's only because you know someone is not going to judge you, even if it doesn't work, so. Mac, it was your directorial debut, film directorial debut? Yeah, I, did a, I had done a short of it okay. to make sure I could do it. <laughs> Three brothers trying to make their own business, trying to make something. Right. What was the seed of the idea? It was uh, my father in business, you know, worked with his brothers. They split up. They worked together. They split up. And I thought it was a dynamic that lots of families had. Sometimes it was all dressmakers. Sometimes they were builders. And uh, I did it as a play at the West Beth uh, first <laughs> and then in other places three different times. And then I did a short. And it was hard because I think anyone... I mean, now people are talking about all this stuff now being, you know, pigeonholed, stereotype, ghettoized. Mm. But, you know, if you look a certain way or whatever, in the movie business, maybe not in the theater, you know, you, if you, you're, you're either a, on the edge or you're a bad person or whatever. And because it wasn't about that, mm. it was about people who actually were building things and how difficult that is. It was not easy to do. And I really wanted to do it, and I, I'm very, you know, that's a big part of my life growing up, watching that film. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very raw film, but uh, I'm, I know lots of people who have really responded, you know, in a visceral way to it, and, uh, you know, that, that really kind of marked to me, to say just keep pursuing what interests you, yeah. What do you like about directing? Uh, I, I like being able to tell a story that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. That's basic. And maybe working with people that you really like and giving an opportunity to people that you really like. The stress of it is tremendous. It's tremendous. And if you don't do like a genre-oriented thing, if you're trying to do something that you think is really essential or part of the world, it's a, it's a harder thing to, to, 
a road to navigate. And you're going to get beat up, you know, and criticized. But if, it's, if it means a lot to you, then, then it's worth it, you know. Barton Fink was shot in about eight weeks. Nine weeks. Nine weeks. 45 days. <laughs> Who's counting? Um, okay. Is that a short shoot to you or a long shoot to you? That's a perfect size shoot. Nine perfect. weeks. There was sometimes one actor, two actors, and sometimes three actors. There was, yeah, it couldn't have been, uh, you know. Once again, I, I have a rarely, like a shorthand with Joel and Ethan, and we have a wonderful, uh, you know, camaraderie and uh, exchange of ideas. But uh, it was a very creative experience, especially how high my hair grew. So <laughs> it was it was ten centimeters. But yeah, and it was. <laughs> I, you know, and uh, uh, I just, you know, we, we kept we making the movie, and I was thinking, well, who's ever going to see this movie? This is such a strange movie. And uh, I mean, I had scenes with wallpaper, so. Uh, uh, but they're really, they, like Spike, they're two of the, the best people, like, just as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I would do whatever for them. And I have. <laughs> <laughs> and what I falls have. Under, what falls under the category and you have? And I have, yeah. Well, you know, I've shaved my head. I, you know, <laughs> I, I've licked bowling balls. I've done a lot of things. <laughs> I've groveled on the ground, you know. I've, yeah, for certain people, I, I'll go the whole talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I really, it's more like when you had a friend in second grade and you want to do something to make them laugh mm -hmm. or to make them happy or delight, delight them. And that is an aspect of working with directors, you know, or working with other people. And I think either you're a people person, mm -hmm. you like people. There are a lot of people in th my business that don't like people. They just mm -hmm. like what they think, you know. Uh, or, mm -hmm. and, but that's part of, you know, I, I've worked with those people. <laughs> I mean, in the old days when it was pretty, pretty abusive. I mean, mm. really abusive. Yeah. I mean, physically abusive. Mm. And you, it was just like, but then you learn to you say, okay, well, the worst they can do is fire me and I'm going to speak up. You know, learn to, mm -hmm. I learned to do that. So. At this point in your career, what does a role need to have for you to take it? Uh, well, you know, you're always reinventing yourself and trying different things and stuff. So when I did something like The Night Of, for example, that was a great role. It was beautifully written. Uh, it was a, a great cast. Mm -hmm. and, and it was about something. Yeah. And it really, it really moved me being in that. I, I felt like I spent a lot of time doing research for that and with successful lawyers, unsuccessful lawyers. And I just thought, well, this is something that uh, I could get lost in. And that was challenging. That was cha I like to do things that maybe I haven't done before. When you've done a lot of things, you, you know, it starts, you go, well, you're looking around, you say, well, mm -hmm. what haven't I done yet, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, this, this fall, I'm, I'm going to do this uh, Philip Roth adaptation and uh, I feel like he's never really been done uh, in his words. I did work with him when I was a young actor. He selected me uh, to, uh, to work with him on a one-man show of Portnoy's Complaint and I, and I did a reading of it and I worked with him alone and I've always and then we didn't do it for a lot of reasons uh, but I've always wanted to do something uh, uh, of his and he was very helpful when I was doing this uh, Primo Levi project, uh, La Tregua, The Truce. He, he, had knew, he knew Primo Levi, mm -hmm. he did a great interview with him, and he was very uh, insightful. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to my encounter with him, uh, you know, undiluted, mm -hmm. undiluted. And that's yeah. gonna be on the stage. Yeah, that'll well. be on the stage, yeah. Let's get to the 2000s, Romance and Cigarettes. This is a wild movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I mean that as a compliment. Susan, what? The, yeah. the cast was James Gandolfini, right. Susan Sarandon, Steve Buscemi, Bonnie, Bobby Cannavale, and Christopher Walken. And, and Kate Winslet in a red wig and a like yeah. red latex number yeah. dancing. As well, 
There's I, I singing. Think, there's dancing garbage men. It's, yeah. it's that to me. It's like right. That movie to me is as personal as Mac. It's basically, you know, working class people of all different kinds of people. With you know, we all have our own a musical mm -hmm. encyclopedia and our musical transportation mm -hmm. and our, an escape from life. In the Dennis Potter says the potency of cheap music, you know, or popular music, and so. I thought, well, how am I going to tell this story? And I thought, well, maybe they'll they'll sing along to their own private soundtrack. But uh, there were things in that movie that that's exactly, you know, I would say, well, if you want to know something about me, you know, watch Caitlin Winslet and James <laughs> Gandolfini. You know, uh, I, I thought of it as Charles Bukowski writing The Honeymoon is as a musical. <laughs> That's it. And to me, that was very close to the way I grew up. You know, like, you were like, there's the poetry that kind of seeps through. And uh, I, I felt really unconscious. And I mean, I think if the movie would have come out, if United Artists had, hadn't been sold, you know, we tested it, I think it would have done you know, way, way better than it did do because we got stuck in litigation. But I feel that, you know, there's something about that movie that, uh, uh, you know, I love Fellini too, but it was my sort of unconscious, you know, uh, version of the life that I grew up around, you know, and, uh, you know, I knew lots of people who wanted to be James Brown. You know what I mean? <laughs> so when Bobby kind of all these things hot pants, it's like, you know, that that was everyone had a band in the backyard, you know. Everyone was, you know, and, and I had to get the rights to these songs. I wondered about and I, I think oh it's, it's built for a comeback though. This is movie. Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, gonna start it. Okay, well, thank um, you. I think it's <laughs> listen, I think it's one of the best things Kate Winslet. I mean she's she's amazing in it. She's amazing in it. And uh, you know, I showed her and Margaret and Tina uh, Turner in Tommy. I said, look at these ladies. I said, that's, can you, I said, that's what I want from you. I said, you know, and we did the craziest kind of acting exercises and, you know, she's unleashed. Yeah. I, she, she's unleashed. She, James Gandolfini was, may he rest in peace, he was really intimidated by her. <laughs> he was like, he was like, man, she's scary. He was like, she's scary. He was like, she's scary. And James is, I mean, yeah. he's just a beautiful, you know. I always told him, I said, I saw him as like a big Italian woman. And he, he, didn't, he didn't take that very well, you know. Uh, he was really upset about it. But he has sister, but he's such a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, such great chemistry with every woman in the film. And I said, mm -hmm. well, it's obviously you had sisters, you know. Yeah. So you just, uh, and uh, so yes, well, thank you. I, that's really a... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's worth seeing. Watch it. Yeah, for it's real. worth seeing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In let's talk about the twenty tens. Last time, I think when you were on my show, we were talking about Gloria Bell, right, with Julianne Moore, and right. you play this kind of unimpressive boyfriend. Yeah, right. Named Arnold. Yes, I know. Uh, what was it about this unappealing man that you I, liked? I, I listen. I wanted to work with the director. And I thought it was a, a, a fantastic woman's story. Mm -hmm. and it, it was really about his mother. I, the original one is fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I love the original one. And I thought, you know what? There are times you do it for the role, and there's times you do it for the subject matter, and, it's, and, and the people who are involved. And that's important to mm -hmm. me, too, to do that, and not just kind of talk that, but to do it, to do certain things. And I, I think there's just... You know, so much violence in the world, and mm -hmm. so, that sometimes when someone's trying to do something different, and it has this gentleness, and, and it was very complicated, mm -hmm. uh, that I thought it would be good to support that. And I loved working with Julianne; she's she's wonderful. Watching our time, I don't want to okay. run out of time. Uh, she's used to that because you have she has the show. So yeah, to, I got an uh, yeah. weird internal yeah. clock. Uh, the Batman. Well, Carmine Falcone, uh, Mob you know, boss. I'm a Batman fan, so I was, like, uh, uh, I, I was a little put off by some of the violence and stuff, but they said mm -hmm. they would do it in a subtle way. And I said, okay, as long as we don't see it, 
I don't want to do certain things. Oh, mm -hmm. I really don't want to do certain things. Mm -hmm. I have an aversion to that. I, if, I, if you've seen certain things in real life, I don't want to do certain mm -hmm. things. And I just feel like, uh, but I, I think it, it turned out you know, really, really well overall. And it was sort of a, a scary character, but yeah. it's kind of subtle. And I got to work with Zoe and Robert, and I liked them very much. I was going to ask, what kind of questions do you ask when you get approached by something that big, which is kind of part of a machine? Yeah, it's part of a machine, but I was like, you know what, I'm not putting my hands on, like, you know, uh, unless I'm in a battle. I said, I'm not going to put mm -hmm. my hands on, uh, on a woman. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to do that, you know. And then, uh, of course, at the end, he fights with his illegitimate daughter or whatever. But, uh, you know, you have to kind of feel how it makes you feel mm -hmm. as a person and do you want to put certain things in the world I know it's you know make believe and stuff but it still means something to you you know yeah. when you do it so let's talk about the exhibition a little bit yeah it's pretty it was so great and some of the themes one of the themes is about our spaces and our urban spaces and the stories right. that are told in our spaces What's a New York City block that you love or you have a, a great feeling about? Well, I love a lot of the blocks, you know, in the, in the West Village, you know, in, in the East Village, too, because that's where my, you know, my relatives came through. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the Brooklyn Bridge, you know. love the book about the Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I like to see downtown... The, the things that remain, because so much of it mm. has been raised and knocked down, and to see a little history, and I think the way history is taught, you know, now there's all these ridiculous conversations, it, you know, it, it should be one thing, that hi history should be an expansive, living subject matter mm -hmm. that keeps expanding and not shrinking, and not mm -hmm. doing a reductive version of, of uh, and this it's it's in, it's informative to help you live your life or be mm -hmm. a parent you know mm -hmm. or and so uh, you know there are a lot of those little things I miss a lot of the old uh, movie theaters that I used to go to and yeah. the little theaters one theater that I loved and I loved it so much was the ridiculous theater but that Charles Ludlum had at Sheridan Square and I used to go there and I would giggle before the show started. <laughs> and Charles Ludlum was a genius. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, I never saw someone who made me, like, I felt like he was tickling me when I mm -hmm. went to, into the theater. And so there were a lot of these little playhouses that I used, I could afford with no money to go walk in for a couple bucks and go see a play. So I, I miss some of those. And I, I still uh, search for them sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, there were so many theaters in New York at one time, you know, so. Home is a part of the exhibition. Tell us a great New York City apartment story. Oh, Everybody's I'm, got a good apartment story. Well, I, I lived in a studio apartment. I don't know if I have a great story, you know. I, mean, I know how I got that apartment. I, I, I looked mm -hmm. at, it, we, it was, I went to a realtor, and another person was looking at it, too. And I, and I realized, who's going to get to the apartment first? I knew right away. And I was like, <laughs> I had sneakers on. And I, 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 and I was like, I'm beating this person. This is a four floor walk up. And I ran like a demon, a demon. And I, and I beat them, I beat them there. And I made it up there. And I said, I'll take it. You know, I got up there. So uh, that was on East 73rd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue, yeah. But I, I never had, my friend had, the bathtub in the kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. and with the chain. I always wanted that for some reason. <laughs> I, I just thought it was so, I don't know, the idea, I mean, the idea of doing your dishes over the bathtub mm -hmm. isn't so great, but I don't know, there's something very charming about it to me. I just, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I like old buildings, I do. Yeah. Do you have a favorite uh, park or common space in the city that you like? Well, we use Prospect Park a lot because mm -hmm. we go there, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Central Park, I mean, obviously, sure. too. But uh, Prospect Park is, mm -hmm. I've shot in there uh, in, uh, some of my movies. I've also shot in Greenwood Cemetery, too. So, uh, you know, uh, I love 
being able to walk to work, that's fantastic. Yes. That's fantastic. I, mean, I just, <laughs> you know, love it. But you don't want to shoot in Prospect Park at night because then the other people come out, like the, the little people. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm really like squeamish about it. I'm not very brave. Not good with those. No, I, mm -mm. I, get, I have PTSD. No. It triggers me immediately. I'm like, ah! You know? <laughs> you know? I can't do it, I can't do it. Yeah, I'd rather have like be eaten by a lion. Then yeah. Much rather. Yeah. Ratatouille yeah. coming by. Uh, do you have a New York moment on film you love or you think about? A, a New York moment on film, you mean films that I grew up watching? Yeah. Well, certainly Sweet Smell of Success, that comes to my mind. On the Waterfront was really shot in New Jersey, but I always, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, definitely Sidney Lumet comes up a lot. A lot mm -hmm. of his movies, just, they really captured, you know, New York in, in all the different boroughs. Uh, but when I see some of these old actors, you really, you, you hear the sounds of like when you see James Cagney, mm -hmm. you go, oh, well, he grew up, you know, in Germantown, then mm -hmm. and you just, you just see old New York, yeah. you know, in a way. And so, uh, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's Sorry. a great answer. This is a little bit of, I hope it's not too much of a downer question. I don't think it is. Maybe, I don't know. Um, were you confident New York was gonna come back? after the pandemic? Like think about, let's say, uh, fall of 2020. Well, New York is always ch changing, and it's like as we grow older, we just go, it's just, it's another adjustment to make. But it, it was surreal. I mean, to see Central Park South empty, yeah. I had to go and get a root canal right at the beginning, and uh, I had come back from London because I was doing Batman, and they stopped. And I went up there, and I was like, there was no one on Central Park South. And I went up, and there was no one in his office. And then when he was giving me the needle, he's a, he's a great guy, uh, 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 Dr. Harris. I was thinking, I said, well, if he has a heart attack <laughs> while he's doing this, I said, there's, there's no secretary here. There's nobody here. I said... I'm gonna have the needle in here. He's gonna. I was thinking about all this stuff about him dying on me. I was thinking, oh, you know. I said he looks like he's in good shape, you know. <laughs> but all these things are going through your mind. But uh, did I think it would come back? I think, you know, I don't think it's come back, you know, completely, mm -hmm, no. you know. But uh, I take the trains, you know. I wear a mask on the trains. Mm -hmm. I still do do yeah. that. But. Uh, you know, it's come back before, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it reinvent, reinvents itself. I really hope that they can find a way that people can live in New York mm -hmm. because by, mm -hmm. by pricing everyone out, it's, yeah. it, it changes the whole, you know, tapestry uh, yeah. of it. And that you lose so, so very much. I really, mm -hmm. I really think that. Anything you want to say before we wrap up that I didn't ask you about, or any uh, of your films you want to talk about? We've got mm, a minute or two. No, I just hope to, you know, uh, th th they don't put me out to pasture. <laughs> 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 I, I hope to do some more interesting, good things, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. It's a great museum, and it's a pleasure to speak with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John and Allison. What a great conversation. Let's have another round of applause. So.